good morning, buenos dias. Um, my name is Kate Cullen, and as a Fulbright student scholar, I'll be researching innovative modeling and effective adaptation um, techniques to address uh, Chile's rapidly disappearing glaciers. Um, I'm embarking on this project as a f one of a few glaciology folks um, and also pre-graduate school folks, um, so it might not be immediately clear how I came upon this project um, and what drew me here. Um, so I'll start a bit with my background. I graduated from Wesleyan University, as I said before, in 2016 um, with a double major in earth sciences and history focusing on Latin America. Um, and prior to my senior year, um, most of my like summer internship experience and work experience was in environmental policy um, at the U.S. Geological Survey, um, the White House, and the World Resources Institute in Brazil. Um, and I had a great opportunity um, to do an undergraduate thesis on Antarctic ice sheet behavior uh, between 3.8 and 3 million years ago, which is the mid-Pliocene epoch, um, which is a really interesting time to look at Antarctic um, ice sheet sensitivity and behavior because climate conditions were pretty similar then to what they are today. Um, so you can see me doing some of that work here with an x-ray fluorescent uh, machine scanning marine sediment cores from Antarctica from off the coast of Antarctica. Um, and this work showed me how glacier retreat is one of the most pressing um, climate change impacts um, that we're feeling today and threatens everything from water security in mountainous countries such as Chile um, to coastal communities um, around the world that will be experiencing floody or flooding and already are experiencing flooding. So with this love of science research, policy work, um, and different community organizing that I did, at, in college, um, I went on to work for um, Abilini Bezakaya, which is an environmental um, and food security nonprofit in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, and then I went to work on climate and energy issues for the Union of Concerned Scientists in Oakland, California. Um, but what kept drawing me back was the idea of coming back to Latin America after studying abroad in Brazil and interning in Brazil um, and returning to glacier behavior work. Um, so I devised this project to do just that and combine everything I'm interested in. And as a quick, quick extra tidbit, um, I just completely became uh, interested in international climate negotiations and um, the intersection of international relations and climate issues, um, working at the COP23 United Nations meeting um, this past November as an assistant for the um, small Pacific island nation of Palau, an assistant on their national team. So my project, um, I will be working with um, Maisa Rojas at um, Universidad de Chile. Um, Maisa was a lead author on the IPCC fifth assessment report um, and is regarded as um, a, a pretty impressive paleoclimatology and um, climate modeling researcher. Um, and I'll be working with her. I'll be taking one or two classes at Universidad de Chile, um, and I'll be working with her on incorporating paleoclimate uh, data into models of present climate behavior and glacier behavior um, in Chile. Um, for the whole country, it's more like large-scale modeling um, and also involved in kind of the international relations work that she does. Um, and I'll also be involved in the Center for Climate and Resilience Research, which is based in, at Universidad de Chile. In July, um, I'll move down to Valdivia, which is down here, Santiago's up here, um, and be working with um, uh, Professor Maria Schaefer at um, Universidad Astral, um, and he does more hands-on monitoring um, and modeling of glaciers such as Macho Glacier, which is located here, um, and as well as um, Gray Glacier and other glaciers in um, Patagonia, which Northern Patagonian Ice Sheet and Southern Patagonian Ice Sheet. Um, and he's also uh, a leader at, in the Glacial Hazards in Chile uh, Consortium, which is an international research group, um, and the Cryospheric Society of Chile, which he helps lead. <clears throat> so, the main question that guides my research is how does glacier retreat from climate change threaten water security in Chile? And by water security, I mean all senses of the word, from um, water availability and access um, to the risks and hazards that rapid glacier retreat presents. 
Um, and to start narrowing down on that question, I'm interested in how glacier monitoring and modeling studies can be effectively incorporated into regional and global climate change models and the implications and usefulness of even doing so. And moving into the second half of my project, I'm going to bring these questions to be more tangible um, and narrow in on what is the change in surface mass balance, ice flow velocity, um, and glacier, glacial <coughs> characteristics of Macho Glacier, which is in the Chilean Lake, lake District. Um, and what are the risks, uh, what risks do glacial outburst floods pose to local populations in the Chilean Lake District, as well as um, communities in Patagonia? And how can the results of these studies and models be used to help local populations prepare for changes in freshwater resources and rapid flooding? I know many people in this room are pretty uh, familiar with uh, water availability, availability issues and why uh, glacier retreat is such a pertinent issue here in Chile, but just for the context and to fill everyone in, um, glaciers and snowpack are critical resources, um, critical sources of fresh water in Chile. For example, uh, the over 7 million residents of Santiago metropolitan region receive their water primarily from Maipo River, uh, which originates in uh, snow-covered and glacier-covered um, high-altitude area uh, near the Maipo volcano. And Chile holds the largest mass of glaciers in South America, um, and every one of them overall is in retreat, except for one. So what is the state of current water stress in Chile? Well, water demand in northern and centr central Chile, um, so this is the Sant Santiago metropolitan region moving northward and so southward, um, available water resources in blue exceeds um, water demand in the southern areas, but going north from Santiago, the opposite is true. So already Chile is in some state of water stress, um, and this is only projected to get worse with climate change. Um, in 2015, um, the World Resources Institute um, published a study of, um, sorry, these are realizing are either out of order. <laughs> <laughs> um, the World Resources Institute ranked Chile 24th in the world and first in the Western Hemisphere, hemisphere um, for water stress by 2040. Um, so that's pretty significant. And they attribute Chile's move from today medium uh, water stress to extreme water stress by 2040 um, to changes in precipitation, um, temperatures, and the loss of glacial reserves and snowpack reserves. Um, so as you can see, this is different modeling um, results for projected um, reduction in precipitation. Um, specifically, what's of greatest interest is here in the central region, where you can see the most kind of blue, which <coughs> indicates um, greatest percentage change. Um, and this is comparing the period between 1961 and 1990 as a whole um, to 2011 to 2030. So you can see that the relative um, water uh, abundance or security in, in that sense that uh, the southern and um, central region has used to develop economic resources, agriculture, mining, all these different um, really important activities um, is going to be changing in the next um, in the next 20 years even more. Um, so as you can see, heightened water stress and the loss of glacier reserves uh, are grave concerns here in Chile. And zooming in here on the Chilean Lake District, um, you can see Valdivia marked here. Just to orient you, um, Chiloé is over here, and uh, this is the Macho uh, Chashuenco volcano, um, and the Macho Glacier is on the southern part of that volcano. Um, and so that will be my primary study area uh, when I go down to Valdivia and work with um, Mari Schaefer there. And just to give you a sense of um, what glacial retreat looks like at this um, volcano site, in the darkest color here you can see glacial cover in 1976, and then in the grayish color in 1987, and then the lightest color in 2003. So a pretty significant retreat. Um, and this year, Dr. Schaefer is planning on working on glacial modeling um, and predicting glacial hazards at Gray Glacier, which is here in the Southern Patagonian um, ice sheet. And I'm hoping to jump on that bandwagon as well and get down there and help with some field work. <laughs> 
So, uh, a few other miscellaneous curiosities and other things I'm looking forward to learning more about and kind of gleaning information on um, are the intersection of indigenous rights issues with glacier issues um, from Puche communities and other communities, uh, the role of environmental conservation movement in Chile in protecting glaciers, the degradation of glaciers for mining activity, um, the implications of glacier retreat for hydropower, and the impact of water stress on the wine industry and other agricultural sectors here in central Chile. And this is what I'm hoping to be doing a lot of here in Chile, climbing up on glaciers, or climbing up on mountains and um, uh, looking at glaciers. So I'm so grateful um, to be here and I'm looking forward to learning from all of you um, as we spend our time here together. And yeah, any preguntas, consultas? <laughs> Thank you. Well, first, please. Yes, please, let's get some questions. Yeah. Um, this seems really, really awesome. Uh, so you said that you'll be working to incorporate existing climate data into models. Uh, where is that data taken from? Is it global or is it regional to Chile? Um, so some of it uh, that Maisa Rojas has is um, data that she's done from past work, and it's from Chile. So the, uh, what I'm, what I'll be working on with her um, in her lab is how she's using that data and that understanding to inform other models that they're building now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of not of glacial behavior, but of climate models. Of climate models, yeah, but also um, some of the outputs from that for those models are like glacial cover and how it'll be affected, mm -hmm. temperatures and precipitation and everything. Cool. Yeah. So you briefly mentioned the glacial outburst floods. I'm kind of curious mm -hmm. if that's going to be like part of your modeling, if you can capture how like, catastrophic and how quickly those things can happen, or if it's mainly more like the climate side. Of yeah, so that's one piece I'm um, really interested in. Um, and obviously, you know, grabs a lot of headlines, like is pretty, it's destructive. Uh, it's pretty devastating um, when um, such as at Colonia Glacier, Glacier and um, um, along the Baker River in northern Patagonia, um, various outburst floods that they've had that have just completely like wiped out agricultural land and communities. Um, the one thing that I've been warned about is that um, as far as like imminent threats to Chile, because it affects such a small population and mostly rural land, um, some of the researchers that I've talked to like don't see it as like the most pressing issue to be studying right now. Um, with that said, I think it's really interesting and obviously um, very important. So my work will not probably directly be on glacial like outburst floods. Um, I'll be doing a bit of it with um, uh, Professor Schaefer in Valdivia because he works a lot on glacial hazards in general. Um, but yeah, I won't specifically be working on gloss. They're called yogel clipes, right? That's the Icelandic word, I think. Um, like yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like all the, the fun abbreviations. <laughs> what does field research on a glacier look like? Maybe taking like ice core samples or something? great question. Um, the previous field research I've done is um, sitting in a marine uh, sediment core repository, basically a huge refrigerator, um, pulling out uh, marine sediment samples from millions of years ago and then putting them through different instruments and machines. So I've never personally actually done uh, glacier field research um, on a glacier. But uh, from what I understand, there's uh, you know different instruments that you use uh, to measure ice thickness and um, a lot of satellite imagery, really, that's um, through computer modeling and um, analysis to look at like um, change in glacial uh, overall size, and then you can also now measure like the thickness mm -hmm. of that, and sometimes the bedrock um, geology as well. Okay. Yeah. Time if it is another question. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm curious. You mentioned um, eventually getting into looking at how indigenous fights might intersect with these, um, with like climate change and glacier retreat. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. how you imagine going about looking at those intersections, like interviews, archives. Yeah, so I say that's a curiosity because yeah. it's something I'm really interested in um, and I've read about, you know, but I. I know we all have limited time here and you can't tackle every single issue mm -hmm. as much as I'd want to. Um, so as far as directly like my work here, mm -hmm. I don't think I'll be doing interviews, but I think as like a future project um, or uh, something that someone else would do, yeah, that would be 
important. But what I'm hoping to understand is like how are these spaces um, culturally significant, mm -hmm. sacred, mm -hmm. and what um, is the dialogue in indigenous communities around that? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Well, I'll be looking forward to reading about this uh, when you, at the uh, end of the month report. But, uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>